you ever watch documentaries? Um, some, I'd say. I don't know. Maybe. Yes. I would say yes, too, on Netflix. Yes. I love nature documentaries. I watch them actually a lot. I was about to say, like, I've seen some, like, murder documentaries because oh, yes, I've heard about too. them, like, on TikTok, and then they interested me, but I haven't seen any nature ones yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll I watch I think one. I've watched a lot of, like, murder mystery ones, yeah. uh, nature, and then I've also watched, like, just, like, human interest ones, like, twins getting reunited, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you have a favorite one? Pretty much anything Ken Burns has done is really great. Mm -hmm. Right now I've been super into Rocky Mountain PBS for some reason. Oh, they cool. keep showing up on my YouTube, so I know a lot about Colorado right now. <laughs> my favorite one's called like The Family Next Door, I think, or like The American Family. It's about Chris Watts, like that murder. My favorite is my uh, of my octopus teacher. Oh <laughs> it's a gosh. really good one. I started that one. I it's need to it's life changing. It makes me emotional. It's oh really God, good. I've never heard oh, of that. Oh, I and Blackfish. Where do you usually watch your documentaries? <laughs> Disney Plus. Uh, Netflix. Netflix. Have you ever heard of Land Grant Films? No, I do not. Don't. Maybe, but I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Welcome back to Vol Talk. I'm your host, Ali LaRosa. Today, we're here with Dr. Nick Geidner, the director of Land Grant Films, to talk about what Land Grant is working on this semester and how it helps students get experience. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So what is Land Grant Films? Uh, Land Grant Films is a documentary production program housed in the School of Journalism and Electronic Media here at UT. And our goal is to provide UT students with real world uh, documentary production experience while working with nonprofits and community organizations to try to provide video assets and things that they can use to raise awareness, funds, um, and really get their message out there. That's great. So you said hands-on experience. What does that look like? Um, our students work on every phase of documentaries from uh, pre-production and research all the way through shooting and editing uh, to final edits and sending things out to distribution. So why would you say it's important for the students to get this experience? Um, I think, you know, any kind of experiential learning where you're actually uh, working on products that are going out into the public and have um, the real feel of a real world experience mm -hmm. is really uh, incredibly important in addition to classroom learning. Uh, classroom learning should give you the theory and the ideas behind things and those are incredibly important to give to students and to instill in them. Mm -hmm. But then there's different things about real world experience that makes you think on the fly. Yes. We can teach theoretical things until we're blue in the face, but until you're forced to make a decision out in the field between decision A or decision B, mm -hmm. you really don't know what it's like to do that. Yeah. And so that's what we try to do, and we try to do it in a situation where, um, you know, failure is part of the model. Um, students do mess things up. I mean, it is part of the model and it's better that they mess up here than <laughs> when they're in their first job or yes. things like that. And so we try to create a system where students have freedom uh, and they can try things, they can do things, occasionally they can fail, but at the end of the day we make uh, really solid products, professional mm -hmm. products that can go out into the marketplace and be used in the community, in the, in the country, and in the world. So do you have any students that have learned that experience and gone out and have jobs now? And oh yeah, we have students uh, all over the place. Uh, we have students working in local television. We have students working uh, for HGTV. We have students working for Sony Television Pictures. Um, we have students all over the place doing, uh, doing things that represent what we do during our, our production process. That's great. I'm pretty sure they're thankful for the experience they've gotten. So what are you working on now? So right now we're working on a couple projects, but the big one is uh, Baker for America, which is a documentary about uh, the former, the late Senator uh, Howard Baker. Mm -hmm. How is that going? Well, it's going really well. It's in, it's deep in post-production. Uh, we've been working on it for about a year and a half. 
And now we're in the process of really trying to bring everything together, mm -hmm. which is, you know, fantastic uh, to see things starting to come together, but also an incredibly stressful period because you're, you're taking all these parts. We shot 14 interviews, we have a bunch of narration, we have a bunch of ideas that we're trying to bring together. And you're really trying to jigsaw puzzle this into a thing. And oh, it's, I bet. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a hard uh, process, but when you land it, it's, it's really fantastic to get to when you break a scene, when you figure out how I'm going to get from point A to point mm -hmm. B, it can be really a fantastic feeling. Do you have a storyboard for it? Like, do you know what it's going to look like? Yeah. I mean, we've been constantly, constantly developing uh, a plan for the film from a year and a half ago. Um, and it's just constantly, it's an iterative process where mm -hmm. you're slowly making the film better and better and better. You start with a generic idea. I want to do X, Y, and Z. And then as you're shooting, you start replacing X with something yes. a little bit different, same, but a little bit different, a little bit better. And you hope that through that iterative process, at every point you're making the film just a little bit better, mm -hmm. a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more powerful, and a little bit more related to the audience you're trying to hit. Right. So what drew you to choosing the Baker documentary? Well, really, it was a thing where um, the Howard Baker Center for Public Policy here at the University of Tennessee, um, after the, the success of the Dolly Parton documentary that we did, the library that Dolly built, mm -hmm. um, they approached me about um, doing a documentary about Howard Baker. And honestly, at the time when they approached me, I didn't know a lot about Howard Baker. I knew the the basics, uh, how he was involved in Watergate, um, a, l a few other things like mm -hmm. big high level things, but I didn't know a ton about him. And so I went and researched Howard Baker and sort of thought about his story and mm -hmm. thought about how it connected to uh, where we are as a country in thinking about political discourse right. and thinking about politics and politicians. And I thought that this was a story that we could use. His story was really one that we could use to point out how politics can be effective, mm -hmm. how politics can be useful, and how we can try to figure out, not to go back to those days, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want that, there were all kinds of other problems right. with our country <laughs> then, but thinking about how we can take some lessons from this one person who was by no means perfect, mm -hmm. but we can take some of those lessons and apply them to uh, what we seek from our modern politicians. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of what interested me. Um, that and sort of the idea of the overarching story was interesting. And then the idea that I have a lot of students, students, students like you mm -hmm. that come into my office and say, hey, I want to get involved in land grant or I want to get involved in journalism. And one of the reasons that they want to get involved is because they want to make a change in our, our society, in mm -hmm. our community. And I have so many students that come to me and want to get involved in land grant that really they want to get involved in politics, but right. they don't want to get involved in politics because mm -hmm. politics is ugly and messy mm -hmm. and so they want to get involved in making change in their community and they see this way uh, documentary and video mm -hmm. production and storytelling as a way to do it but I think there's also ways we can get involved politically and I think a lot of students are being turned off to getting involved in politics mm -hmm. as politics. I agree but I think it's good that they're using their voice and they're getting their message out there has there been any students that you've been like surprised by their beliefs or about the... I mean, I was really surprised and sort of part of this iterative process is trying to figure out how to do things. And one of the things that we wanted to do was use some student voice here and there mm -hmm. as basically bumps between segments to act as transitions. And, you know, we went out and did some, they're called man on the street interviews. Mm -hmm. So we just went out with a, with a camera and talk to some random students and yes. ask them about politics. And I was really impressed with the, the level of nuance that I got in mm -hmm. the answers. Um, they were really uh, powerful and they were really intelligent mm -hmm. and they were really also 
confused as well, yes. which I think really, really helps. Um, mm -hmm. There were a lot of students who were saying, yeah, social media is one of the problems with polarization in America and our modern politics. Mm -hmm. But then they were also saying, yeah, I, I still use it an hour a day or whatever. And so there was this kind of, uh, this kind of nuance that I think is important. And so uh, as we were doing those, we sort of thought, well, how can we do more of this? Mm -hmm. How can we use more of this student voice? And so now sort of in doing those initial ones, we thought, well, we can do more of this mm -hmm. and we can use them really to flow through the whole film. And so I think I was, I was just really surprised by how even keel they were. They, they weren't, oh, far left or far right. They were very in the middle and just saying we want politicians that do things, which right. is sort of my goal for the whole film. That's great. So how would you say, like, how bad is political polarization gotten? I mean, I think it is one of these things where it depends how you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, are we dis divided on some issues in our country? Mm -hmm. For sure. Yes. Are the extremes further apart than they were in previous times? Yes. Are the parties as organizing structures more di divided in what they want? Mm -hmm. Yes. But are people in many cases very divided? I'm not sure. I think in many cases we can find common ground, um, especially things that matter. And I think that's right. one of the things that from the students we've talked to, from the experts mm -hmm. we talked to, from the former politicians we've talked to, everyone that we've talked to said that there's a lot of focus on things that don't matter. And I think that's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting bogged down by a lot of issues that are not really issues that affect people, mm -hmm. but that we spend a ton of time talking about and that we spend a lot of time uh, hating the other side about. And although, you know, some of these are things that, yeah, we can have opinions about, yeah. they're probably not things that actually affect our government really or our everyday life really. And so I think uh, one of the things that we can think about is, you know, how we can get back to really focusing on issues that matter mm -hmm. and how we can work on making uh, solutions as opposed to just arguing. Right. I love that. I think you have a great point. And I think with our generation, G Generation Z, we're very vocal about things and we actually back up our facts or our opinions with facts and I think it's good that we're willing to learn more and more and to have people like you to ask those questions because sometimes it's scary to not have an answer or be scared to say that it's the wrong answer. And I think what we found even with these initial interviews with students is a lot of students say they're more than willing to talk about politics mm -hmm. but they only talk about it to their friends right. and there's this perception that they can't talk to other people. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that is true. Yeah, there's definitely some situations where voicing a political viewpoint in the current climate mm -hmm. will be met with hostility, unquestionably. But I think there's also a greater perception mm -hmm. that it will result in hostility than an actual reality that it will result into hostility. And so I think that's one of, the, one of the things that we need to think about and focus on is trying to reduce perceptions of the vitriol out there. I think there are some people and social media amplifies those mm -hmm. some people. But I think in many cases, people are willing to talk about politics. I mean, do you wanna walk up to someone and say, hey, what are your feelings on abortion? Probably not, but yeah. <laughs> there's many political issues, many, many that aren't abortion. Right. And I think those are things that, that we can at least start the conversation with. So when you went to those students, like give an example of what questions you asked. Uh, we've been, you know, and this is part of the, like I said, the, the process of mm -hmm. trying to figure out, like we started just talking 
really generically about politics and what they thought of the state of politics because the original plan was just to sort of use them in the open and a couple other little places. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going back and using them more broadly. Um, and so we're asking more targeted questions about like what the attributes you want of leaders. What should politicians be doing? What type of people should be politicians? Mm -hmm. Who should who should run for office? What should they be focusing on? And so we're asking a little bit more targeted questions now because we're trying to uh, use these student voices a little bit more broadly throughout the piece. I like how you ask more like just what is politics than just like the specifics of it because it makes you like really think like what am I arguing for? Yeah. And trying to stay away from, in, especially in these, we're not trying to queue up a political position. We're trying to get to know what is important about politics, what mm -hmm. politicians should be doing, and what politicians should be doing probably isn't tied to a single issue. Mm -hmm. It's not politicians should be, you know, pro-guns or anti-guns. It's that politicians should be, you know, trying to address issues that matter, should right. be standing up for their convictions, should mm -hmm. be willing to compromise in places that they can. Those kind of universals are things that we should be judging our politicians from. Right. And then from there, we should trust those people to make sound decisions mm -hmm. about the issues that we find important. Right, was it hard when you were filming to like stay in more in the middle or did you have some opposing opinions or did it? Um, I mean, I think in thinking about all of this, it. It's not staying in the middle um, mm -hmm. because I, I don't think we should focus on the middle per se. Some mm -hmm. issues we should lean right on. Some issues we should lean left on. Sometimes some parties are right on things. Other times they're not. I mean, I think it's a matter of thinking about how we can have real conversations. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and for me, I mean, I think it's about boiling down to get to the right question and thinking about what we should be asking. And I think that's where we get lost. We don't even know what question we're asking. And so finding a solution is impossible. Right. And so I think that's sort of what, what I focus on is sort of how do we use these stories, Baker's stories, to point out how we can arrive at solutions how we can understand the questions that need to be asked. Right, is there a set date when this is gonna come out or? Um, we're in post right now okay. and we hope to have it, we hope to have a version of the film done before the end of the semester so we can, we wanna get it to, the, the film is actually targeted towards 18 to 22 year olds. Okay. And unfortunately I am no longer <laughs> 18 to 22. <laughs> and so uh, we want to do some focus grouping and make sure the things that we think will resonate with mm -hmm. students are resonating with students. And then um, we hope to get it out probably in the fall, um, but with the Baker Center becoming the Baker School, mm -hmm. uh, they're very busy right now and we don't want to get lost in their busyness. So we're open for whatever works best for their schedule as well. We wanna get it out as far and wide as we can. And so whatever timetable works, but sometime next year, next school year. That's great, I'll definitely be tuning in to see it. Um, do you have a favorite memory from the Baker documentary? I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, I don't know if I have a favorite memory per se, but I think just along the process, getting to see um, our students sort of understand this complex story, mm -hmm. because it really is like, even when you compare it to the library that Dolly built, mm -hmm. uh, a feature length that we did about Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, like that was a lot more simple story to digest. Um, this is complex and nuanced and deals with, you know, social science theory, thinking about polarization mm -hmm. and thinking about how we're divided as a society. And so it was, it's a much more complex thing to understand and getting to see some of our students dive into that and understand that and try to figure out how to best 
visualize that or tell that in in video in television storytelling in mm -hmm. that kind of style has been fun to see that's awesome so for the last question mm -hmm. what would be your what do you want the audience to take away from the documentary I mean I think my takeaway has always been that the same as what I hope to do with land-grant films is that I want to convince students that they can do bold, big, audacious things in their community mm -hmm. and that we can make change in our community for the better. Um, our little film, The Library That Dolly Built, uh, helped raise a quarter million dollars for the Imagination Library. It's screened all over the country and all over the world and that's just a little movie that we made here on Rocky Top with a bunch of my students. We can do big, bold, audacious things, and your generation specifically can do a lot to help our world get better. Right. And so there's no limit to what you can do. It's just a matter of deciding that we want to do it and putting the effort, the time, the passion into it to do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that somebody like you started an organization like this and to have experience for students like me and students here on campus. And I'm excited to see where it goes and to check out the documentary. Well, well we <laughs> will, hopefully you will hear about it. Um, I'm sure we're gonna do a screening over the Baker Center at some point, but then we're hoping to get it out on uh, television across the state and on streaming platforms and everything like that. That's amazing. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thanks again, Nick, for coming. Thank we'll you. see you next week for another episode of All Talk. Thanks for watching.